also to those who will be joining us um, remotely. Today, we will explore how punitive drug policies have accelerated environmental degradation and pose a serious threat to climate mitigation, adaptation, and justice. This is a timely meeting of aligning drug policy with environmental protection. We will be proposing recommendations to ensure that the UN and national drug policies support, instead of undermining the collective efforts made by international community and millions of activists risking their lives to protect nature. My name is Clemmie James. I am a climate activist and I am the Senior Policy and Campaigns Officer at Health Poverty Action. I'm also the coordinator of the Drug Policy, um, Drug Policy Reform and Environmental Justice Coalition, of which members of this panel sit with me. We are delighted today to be joined by the Colombian and the Brazilian delegation, two countries who are guardians to our planet's, one of our planet's largest carbon sinks and most precious rainforests, the Amazon. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you John Alexander Rojas Cabrera, the governor of Nareva from Colombia. Cordial saludo a todas y todos. Soy John Rojas. Hello to all. I am the governor of Nareño, another victim of the conflict in Colombia. The FARC killed my father 25 years ago. Reconciliation and pardon changed my life and the life of my family. And since then, I have dedicated myself to being a defender of peace for greater well-being for my daughters, for our sons, and for the Nariñenses and all Colombians. I'm arriving here to accompany the Vice President of Colombia, who was in Mexico, with the negotiations of the ELN. We continue to support the process, including the total peace that our President Gustavo Petro, the change government, has proposed. I thank the United Nations and the UNODC, the Foreign Ministry, Vice Minister Laura Hill, the Ambassador, and all the team of the Embassy to permit my participation. And thank you to all the institutions and activists that defend the environment. Nariño is a department in the southwest of Colombia. 1,600,000 people, 33,000, 33% is part of an ethnic population, indigenous and Afro. We have a geostrategic place because the Pacific and the Andes and the Amazon are part of our state. We have uh, UNESCO um, heritage, including the carnival, and we have this understanding around um, grass and mopa mopa. We have this richness, this biodiverse richness. Unfortunately, there are 56 thousand hectares of coca that are cultivated in Colombia. This is 28% of the total coca cultivation in Colombia. This, this represents 174 million dollars, 271 million in the pasta base, and 386 million uh, in hydrochloride cocaine. Drug control policies based in glyphosate and aerial 
uh, sprain and forced eradication have failed in Nariño after a week of aspersions, particularly in our, in our zone. This has contributed to an increase in cultivation. We have demonstrated that it is not a solution. It is a po policy that has failed and that before everything has had negative consequences in the security of people. In Nariño, in 2022, there have been 67 homicides, 46% of them, there have been 167, 46% have died in the municipality of Tumaco. They have assassinated 34 leaders, three community leaders, 32 social leaders, 19 of them indigenous, four Afro, three community leaders, and one peasant leader. There are 13 structures that are at the margin of the law and that dispute territory. This conflict has brought us to this issue where the conclusion I can make is that there is a global market that is growing, demanding um, the consumption of drugs. Nariño, with, its, with our social conditions and our geographic conditions, and we understand that, that we have a business and a commercialization that comes from the coca and the presence of non-state um, actors and that the state presence has been weak. Therefore, we <coughs> propose that we need to do a transformation of this illegal economy towards a legal, gradual. We are proposing a de development plan, an integrated development plan along in our zone where Tumaco can be a strategic port for Colombia and the world and to connect us with Brazil. The defense of environment and the search for total peace is what we are looking for in this so that our Afro, indigenous, and campesino brothers and sisters can live in peace. We want to um, reduce the illegal logging and illegal cultivation because that's putting at risk our environment. For that reason, our petition, our, our request is that these territories, these diverse territories, will be given um, this support from all nations. Thank you. Thanks, Kendra. Thank you, Clemmy. Thank you uh, to the organizers, to CND, to all of you uh, for being here. Uh, it is uh, an honor for me to uh, be with you all today. Two weeks ago, I was visiting this mangrove wetland on Costa Rica's Pacific coast. It's a small but vital part of the estimated 147 million hectares of mangroves that encircle the globe, providing key ecosystem services like carbon capture and storage, coastal protection, and fisheries management. This is why the IPCC urges mangrove protection worldwide, and it's why these Costa Rican wetlands are recognized under the Ramsar Convention uh, for their biological and ecological economic importance to coastal people's livelihoods, including the eco-tour that I was part of. But as I learned on that trip, the future of these mangroves hinges as much on biodiversity conventions as, as it does on the drug policies uh, that are being brokered here in Vienna uh, this week. Our superb guide, uh, Carlos, made the connections clear. He told us that over the, could you go back to this? Yeah, no, the other, perfect, yeah. He, yeah, I'll, thank you. He told us that over the past six years, ever since the US Coast Guard had increased patrol pressures on the high seas, trafficking, smugglers running cocaine and marijuana by boat, 
from Colombia to northern Central America had been using the wetlands for drug storage and fuel provisioning. And they're paying uh, local people's unheard of sums to ferry gasoline to them. The effects of their activities are inescapable. Uh, channels are being cut through the mangroves. Young men are leaving fishing and ecotourism for easy money facilitating trafficking. Some have gone to jail, some have been killed. Others are laundering illicit earnings in the fishing and ecotourism businesses in ways that make it much harder for legitimate businesses like Carlos to compete and which put further pressure on an already uh, diminished fish stock. Others are using drug dollars to expand oil palm plantations and cattle pasture into the wetlands. It's illegal, but no one speaks about these environmentally destructive dynamics because no one trusts anyone anymore, not members of fishing cooperatives, not neighbors, not the police. In effect, Carlos summarized in this small but vital site what I and my collaborators have spent the past 10 years documenting at larger scales across uh, Central uh, America, what others have documented in South America, and what others have documented around the world. And that is that the global drug regime is orthogonal to building the sorts of environmental and climate resilience that the planet urgently needs. Let me scale out from Carlos's insights to highlight three mechanisms by which this happens. First, uh, and I, I want to say I base my comments on a pretty, I would argue, a compelling body of evidence, a small part of which is presented uh, here if you'd like to learn more details. But first, I want to be very clear that I'm not talking about the impact of drug crop production on the environment. That is for other speakers to discuss. What I'm talking about is how dramatic environmental harms concentrate in spaces of drug transit and are associated with the investment of drug profits in those spaces. And that originates in the fact that counter-narcotic police and military actions relentlessly push traffickers into remote frontier areas, uh, often in indigenous lands and protected areas. But these remote biodiverse areas are not just logistically convenient, they are also frontiers. So from a business perspective, they represent ideally undercapitalized spaces that are superb for absorbing surplus capital from the drug trade. In through the transformation of forests uh, into oil palm plantations, cattle pastures, uh, aguacate plantations, lo que sea. These are great ways to launder dollars di and diversify income and asset portfolios for traffickers. So to be clear, drug traffickers, for drug traffickers destroying forests and land grabbing is logistically and financially best practice. Second, uh, just as Carlos made clear in Costa Rica as elsewhere, the profitability of drug trafficking means that the trade can seriously distort rural economies. No legitimate activity can compete with a trade that generates billions of dollars annually. In some Central American countries, profits from cocaine transshipment in some years have exceeded direct foreign investment and the value of agricultural exports. The tsunami of drug dollars pulls rural land and labor out of food production, increases the price of staple goods, and further subsidizes extractive activities like gold mining, wildlife trafficking, and illegal, illegal timber harvests. These environmental crimes are more often than not made possible by capital from the drug trade. Third, the IPCC's recent climate change and land uh, report identifies several policy levers that can protect existing forests and restore degraded forest lands, such as capacity building to support resilient biodiverse uh, food production systems and democratic responsive governance systems to manage land at multiple scales. But what happens when existing forests and lands ripe for restoration are coveted or controlled by organized criminals enriched by the drug trade? There is much evidence to show us that effective man the effective management required for their protection is fundamentally undercut by the violent power of organized crime, who will always prioritize their business interests uh, over environmental protection. And as we know too well, and as uh, the governor has just told us, uh, traffickers will kill or compromise anyone who might stand in their way. There is just too much money in the drug trade too much power to control the fate of too much of the world's lands and forests. We have learned from 50 years of counter-narcotic policy 
that there is virtually no amount of military aid, development aid, or anti-corruption initiatives or governance capacity building that can compete. Anyone on the ground in the world's tropical frontiers knows this, and they know why. Because they understand what makes narcos so rich and powerful in the first place. People like Carlos know. He had an enviably straightforward analysis for the social and environmental problems he was witnessing in his community. Next slide. The real problem, he said, was that drugs were illegal. Being illegal made their trade risky, which made them expensive, which meant lots of money. He was emphatic that there will always be demand for drugs. He said controlling drugs in the way that alcohol is controlled was a possible path forward. But not just in one place, he cautioned. As you can read here, he made a good case for global legal regulation. So to align drug policy with environmental protection, I think we should listen. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And, and now I'd like to introduce Dave Ian Taylor from the Global Drug Policy Observatory. Thanks, Dave. Great. Thanks a lot, Clem. Okay. So if we could go to my first slide, please, and then the next one. Thank you. Great. Okay, so I'd like to begin, I promise a very short presentation, um, with a quote from the year 2000 by the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. I'm not going to read the whole quote there, you can do that, but what I'd like to just highlight is the final sentence, which I will read. Although scientists are now able to appreciate the complexity of this web of interacting natural processes, we're still a very long way from understanding how they all fit together. And I think we can argue that this idea of complexity and the processes to improve understanding of how things fit together can be applied not only to our growing understanding of interconnected environmental processes, but also intersecting international issue area regimes and the notion of global governance more generally, including in relation to protection of the environment. And indeed, only a few years after this quote, the International Law Commission established a study group to look at the topic of the fragmentation of international law. And within academia, and particularly within the discipline of international relations, we see around the same time the emergence in the literature of the concept of regime complexes. Now, while typically in academia, I guess there's no agreed definition, what we're really talking about here is an array of partially overlapping and non-hierarchical institutions governing a particular issue area. There's general agreement that such a situation generates um, what we can call rule complexity, and that regime intersection is characterized by complementarity as well as oftentimes, and I would argue more frequently, by tension and conflict. So in terms of international drug policy then, this is in many ways, I think, another dimension of the age-old problem of system-wide coherence, and this is something that Kendra alluded to. And arguably, however, when we're working towards coherence, it's getting more, more pressing as there's a growing understanding of how what's often referred to as the global drug control regime or various variations of that, and then a range of related policy interven interventions uh, beneath that intersect with an array of interconnected elemental regimes or <coughs> regime complexes, including those relating to two associated areas, human rights, and then within that, indigenous rights, and the environment. Um, after all, drug policy at all levels of governance is a classic example of a cross-cutting issue. And these are issues that were flagged up by the CND chair in his opening remarks. Now, I think it's fair to say, it, I think it wouldn't be unfair to say, that what goes on here in Vienna, it's been quite slow to appreciate these interconnections. And furthermore, where the connection is made, some actors inevitably remain resistant. And while progress has certainly been achieved in some areas, there often remain significant tensions. And of course, the example for this is between drug policy and human rights. We've seen it in many parts of the Commission over the week. Now, clearly, there has been progress, but more work certainly needs to be done. And closely related to indigenous rights in particular is a currently far less visible regime intersection where more work definitely 
this relates to global drug control and what we can define as the global environmental regime or regime complex, including within that what we might want to define as the biodiversity regime complex. And I think biodiversity is an issue that often gets overlooked in the very welcome debate about drugs policy and climate change. Now, of course, it's very important with in, in relation to a range of policies targeting crops deemed to be illicit, but also, again, as, as Kendra alluded to, also in relation to what happens around transit hubs. So this slide, apologies it's so uh, dense, is really an early attempt just to map drug policy on top of existing intersections within the, the biodiversity complex and identify points of tension. Now I think of particular relevance here, and this is just what I want to highlight, is um, the 1992 Convention on Biological Diversity, and this is particularly relevant to our discussions in light of the recent COP15 meeting and the 30 by 30 target. Now within the CBD, um, there's recognition, explicit recognition for the first time that conservation of biological diversity is a common concern for humankind and an integral part of the development process. And within this context, um, I think it is in many ways positive to see last year the passage of the, the annual AD, Alternative Development Resolution uh, 65 -1, which within the title as well as the content spoke about measures to protect the environment. And among other things, the resolution flagged up the work of the CBD and crucially encouraged member states to deploy relevant human development indicators. And as many of you probably know, within the cow at the moment, there's discussions about L3. There's lots of good things in L3, uh, particularly, I think, the explicit mention of indigenous peoples. That would be capital I, capital P. But we have to see what, <coughs> excuse me, survives negotiations as the week moves on. Now, this point about indicators and metrics, I think, is crucial in moving away from generalised and abstract discussions and to highlight the need to start thinking in a very practical terms about how to facilitate and, where necessary, soften the, these regime interfaces. And in fact, the CBD sets up a framework for impact assessment and minimising adverse impacts. That's under Article 14. But I think we can and should go further on this. For example, along similar lines to the idea of introducing human rights, risk and impact assessments for new laws and drug policies, why not work on developing a specific biodiversity risk assessment framework to model environmental impacts? So to conclude then, I think as it's been argued elsewhere, as complexity and regime intersections increase, I think we're likely to see the emergence of a new architecture within which international drug policy operates. And where the environment is concerned, to borrow the earlier terminology, there now exists a web of interactions involving system-wide initiatives like the SDGs, um, crucial documents like the UN System Common Position on Drugs, uh, a range of actors beyond member states, so UN agencies, NGOs, and then above this, an array of regimes and associated state obligations. I think that's the key, the key point here, state obligations. So, you know, perhaps we, we might want to call this the global governance complex for drug control. I don't know. But whichever way it's framed, the often conflictual relationship between drug policy and the protection of biological diversity and how that relates to indigenous rights is an issue that's too important to ignore and deserves increased attention at all levels of governance, including here in Vienna, and particularly as we prepare for the midterm review next year. Thank you. 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 Thank you very much for your words at this side event. I come from San Jose, San Jose Guavari. It rains eight months a year, and we have large rivers. Our ecosystems are, our ecosystems are the transition between the Andes and the Great 
uh, Amazonia, key for the equilibrium of the planet. Colombia is the second country with greater biodiversity in the world. We have many uh, we have many uh, guidelines regarding um, environmental order in the territory. We have natural national parks. We have indigenous um, reservations and we have community uh, con uh, consultative boards of Afro-descendants. Um, it's often an, uh, one of the causes associated with deforestation are the, is the cultivation of coca. 52% of those cultivations are in areas that are under environmental control. 20% in uh, black communities, 17 on forest reservations, 4% in natural parks, and 10% on indigenous land. But on a national level, in 2021, the coca has been part of 8% of the total deforestation. According to the Institutional Studies, Environmental Studies, the Institute on Environmental Studies, during 2021 in Guaviare, we deforested 25,000 hectares, even though coca, it was only close to 7,000 hectares. Something that we can see that illegal, um, illegal logging was greater than the coca that was, that was grown. What you can see now is that in this map, the Amazon is there. Cultivation of coca was part of the colonizing forces where there weren't institutions from the government due to a, a lack of agrarian reform in the center of the country. In the beginning of the 1980s, coca was cultivated close to uh, centers but since uh, we have the first law against drugs, cult the cultivation has had to go further and further far away. Um, that has to be, it's true that uh, cultivators have to use um, chemicals so that their plants will grow faster. And they use large quantities of gasoline, cement, and other chemical agents in the processing of pasta base of coca. It's also true that the, the residual effects of the hoja de coca, which has been processed, has um, an impact on the ground and on water. The, the environmental affectations because of the cultivation of coca include deforestation, which can destroy biological co um, corridors, which are important for flora and fauna. This is the most grave because where coca cultivation has happened, it can change, it can convert into a mono cultivation, and so families can sometimes forget to cultivate their their own. Um, food and the illegality of this activity open spaces to disputes between armed actors. To eliminate um, these cultivations and reduce the offer of cocaine, the state has obviously implemented military bases and police. This has been a, a weakening in institutionality. Glyphosate has been used since the end of the 70s against cultivations of cannabis and marijuana in the Santa Marta region, and beginning in 1994, the government ordered campaigns of aerial spraying against coca cultivation. Uh, during the last 21 years, our territories have been fumigated with agrochemicals from the air and with, um, uh, with planes, combat planes. This has been a fierce militarization strategy, an aspect that increased during Plan Colombia. The cultivation of coca has moved from one place to another, yet getting to these reservations, um, indigenous reservations, natural parks. We know that there are now more cultivation than in the last 20 years. Um, the, the data we have can be seen here. Close to 5 million acres were fumigated by air, and more than 2 million acres by land. 
dozens of thousands of infrastructures um, of processing of pasta base has only destroyed without any environmental protocol by the authorities. Tons of chemical waste have been incinerated in the middle of forests because, and this has obviously affected water and the ground. The actions to reduce off the offer, um, to reduce uh, the demand, um, has caused has to reduce supply has caused a duplication of deforestation has dispersed cultivation to zone to zones with greater uh, environmental protection and has affected cultivation of food um, the biological cycle of flora and fauna and in particular insects such as bees and contaminated water and and um, water uh, Fuentes de agua, water fountains. In addition, these aspersions has applied without any sort of environmental protection to human health. In addition to this, the most uh, the most uh, worrying aspect is that we find a perverse uh, policy, drug policy. Thousands of families have been displaced from their places. In my region, half the population is dis displaced according to official data. This is caused by asperse aspersion, aerial aspersion, aerial spraying, by the loss of security, of food security, by the break in their, in our economy, in our peasant economy, and because of the ar armed conflict. This weakening and poverty of people who work in the in cultivation and the lack of opportunities by the state has only facilitated a model that means that more of our of our tierra of our territory is in smaller hands in fewer hands this means that the cultivations of coca are not actually the principal reason to understand deforestation they're just a point of which I'd like to introduce Sylvia Kay from Transnational Institute thanks Sylvia Thanks, Clemmy. Um, I think as all previous interventions have made plain, um, drugs are unequivocally an environmental issue. I think a, that's a very, very strong message that we want to send out with the organization um, of this side event. And in the brief presentation that I will make, um, I want to suggest a, a kind of three opportunities or, or a triad of recommendations, if you will, about how this debate around the impacts of environmental impacts of drugs and environmental impacts of drug policy uh, can be taken forward. So I will in go briefly through three recommendations um, I will make. The first recommendation is to integrate the environmental impacts of drug policy into the 2022 midterm review of international drug policy commitments as reflected in the 2019 CND ministerial declaration. Um, it was already mentioned briefly earlier, but there's also an already agreed upon modalities resolution at this uh, CND that sets out the process and formats for such a review process, including the organization of two interactive multi-stakeholder roundtables in parallel with the plenary proceedings on the topics taking stock, work undertaken since 2019, and then looking forward, the way forward, um, the road to 2029 and beyond. I would argue that in light of government commitments, state obligations really, uh, coming out of both the climate and biodiversity COPs, it is crucial that the environmental concerns in relation to drugs and drug policy are integrated into this review process and in the plans for the coming five-year period. As the UN Secretary General has said, making peace with nature is the defining task of the 21st century. It must be the top top priority for everyone, everywhere. And it is notable in this respect that for the first time, uh, the 2022 UNODC's World Drug Report included a special booklet on drugs and the environment. This can be a useful platform to build on uh, for this review process. However, I would argue that in this review process, um, the international drug policy community must acknowledge the breadth and severity of the environmental impacts associ associated with drug control policies, particularly for countries in the global south. And member states should commit themselves to reforming policies to eliminate this damage. Some of our mo more detailed proposals for doing so are contained in a response that a number of organizations represented here today uh, issued uh, to respond to the World Drug Report and the special booklet um, 
copies of which can also be found um, in the corner of the room. So I'd encourage you to read it. So that's the first recommendation, is really about this midterm review process and yeah, the absolute critical importance of integrating environmental issues there. The second uh, recommendation um, can really be summed up um, in the phrase, uh, don't go it alone. Uh, the agreements of the UN Common Position on Drugs and linkages to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda are all welcome developments that can help to foster UN system-wide coherence and overcome some of the regime contradictions and blind spots that David spoke about earlier. Um, there is certainly much scope, uh, I would submit, at both in-country programmatic level, but also at international regime level, for greater interagency collaboration between UNODC and agencies such as the Uni United Nations Environmental Program, Environment Program, United Nations Development Program, the FAO, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, uh, to mention but a few, to enhance understanding of the drugs environment development nexus. And such interagency collaboration could help in the formulation of what could be called an environmental harm reduction approach um, that can be used to submit drug, drug control policies to an, an environmental stress test or a risk assessment framework, um, as was also spoken about earlier. This would not only put an end, uh, if such a stress test or risk assessment framework were to be adopted, would not only put an end to harmful drug control strategies, such, such as forced eradication or badly designed crop substitution programs, but can also be used to predict and prevent future harm moving forward. So that's the second recommendation about um, breaking silos, interagency collaboration, environmental harm reduction and risk assessment framework. Uh, the third and final recommendation is really about um, some international reform processes, and it's really looking at how best to integrate environmental standards within models of legal regulation. Taking the example of cannabis, for example, uh, the environmental record in jurisdictions where cannabis has been regulated is decidedly mixed. On the one hand, we see the emergence of a standards testing and trade regime that is driving a lot of cultivation indoors, where inter alia, the use of high intensity grow lights contributes to high greenhouse gas emissions associated with indoor greenhouse production. This has come at the expense of legacy can cannabis growers, including in traditional producing countries in the global south, where sun-grown cannabis cultivation is the norm. On the other hand, uh, the design of environmental standards cannot become so onerous, so burdensome, so complex that it generates barriers to entry for those wishing, wishing to transition from the illicit to the illicit market. This cumbersome bureaucracy has, for example, been identified as one of the main reasons for the continuance of an extensive illicit cannabis market, even in jurisdictions where cannabis has been regulated, allowing only bigger players or multi state operators to su successfully navigate uh, the market. This not only facilitates corporate capture, but without proper safeguards in place, also opens up the door to industry greenwashing. A number of organizations represented here today have been engaging in, over the years, in dialogues with governments, uh, operators, civil society groups, and growers about models of cannabis regulation that allow for social equity and environmental sustainability to go hand in hand. There are lessons to be learned, both positive and negative, from experiences with transitions from illicit to regulated markets. And it's important that the CND can provide a space where these lessons can be socialized and where an honest debate and frank exchange can take place. And this is salient not only uh, in terms of cannabis reform, but also in light of the call by the governments of Bolivia and Colombia for an independent review process of the scheduling of the coca leaf. We have heard at this CND, both in plenary and in a number of side events uh, this week on this issue. Uh, these have included also lived testimony from Cocolero, peasant and indigenous communities of the human rights and environmental harms that follow from the persecution of particular plants and the perverse and uninten unintended consequences of punitive drug control policies. Thank you, Sylvia. Final sentence, and I'm just perfect timing. I would, uh, I would just like to leave you with this thought that I think that repairing this rupture of humans from nature 
um, that prohibition really has engendered must be a central priority uh, and direction of travel for all concerned in aligning drug policy with environmental protection. Thank Thanks, you. Sylvia. Um, and <laughs> finally, I'm pleased to say we have closing remarks um, from um, Marta Macado, the National Security uh, Secretary for Drug Policy Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. I, I thank the Transnational Institute for organizing this, uh, this session. I think it's extremely urgent that we connect drug policies with environmental protection. And uh, when we talk about environment, uh, the kind of urgency we have is exceptional. I thank my colleagues. That was, uh, I was really impressed with, with their presentations. I just want to give uh, a final comment on the situation on the Brazilian Amazon. I think you all know that la the last government uh, interrupted the surveillance uh, on the Amazon. Uh, in fact, it, uh, they, the government exonerated officials who have acted against the organized crime, defended the invasion of indigenous land, and supported illegal mining. So uh, during the last government, Brazil reached the highest deforestation rates in 15 years. Destruction uh, of the Amazon was raised to historic levels. Illegal mining also has raised um, and expanded, especially inside indigenous territory, territories as never before, uh, with dramatic consequences, as you all saw the, the recent images of the Yanomani uh, people uh, uh, dying uh, of many diseases that came with the illegal mining, outside the rivers were all contaminated with mercurio and they had no no food. So in the, the fact that uh, the government create this free zone without surveillance, uh, it uh, created this coalition or, uh, or created or uh, incentivized this coalition between networks of uh, drug trafficking and environmental organized crime. So they are now sharing the infrastructure and logistic. Uh, so they are using the same routes for transportation and illegal mining has, be, has been uh, a source of money laundering. So the most impor important drug cartel in Brazil is now uh, deeply involved with the organized crime in Amazonia. And I would make a bracket and say that uh, this uh, big uh, drug cartel in Brazil was also strengthened after decades of politics of mass incarceration and the, the previous drug policy has a lot to do uh, with that result. Uh, I wanted to mention that there is the situation, uh, in this, within the situation there is a constant violence against indigenous population. They are expelled from their territories, the rivers have been poisoned, uh, and uh, there is a progressive involvement also with the local populations in different chains of this uh, of this uh, network. Uh, I would I must say that our main problem is not uh, crops, but uh, the transit and other uh, chains of the of the uh, organized crime. And finally, indigenous women are constant victims of sexual violence. So this is just to make a, a brief description of what we're living and how urgent it is that we tackle this, the, the, the problem together. Uh, the, our Ministry of Justice uh, just established a program that's called uh, Amazonia Mas Segura, uh, Safer Amazon. And there is, uh, of course, a big, Police, federal police operation to try to uh, to expel illegal mining from the indigenous lands and to apprehend all their equipment and etc. But besides that, we are also sending healthcare, social assistance, and uh, mm -hmm. territorial development. This is one of the discussions we are having here at CND. How can we adapt the idea of alternative development? to foster territorial development in the Amazonia and combining it, of course, with environmental protection. 
uh, we are now also changing uh, the law on on the gold chain. There was, in fact, uh, a problem in our legislation that make that uh, traceability uh, very weak. But I also would like to call the responsibility of the global financial market that are receiving gold from uh, illegal mining in Brazil, and that comes from the first station and and uh, violation of indigenous rights. So that that was really just to call attention to the situation and to reinforce my colleague's speech on the importance of this uh, panel. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Marta. <laughs> We will conclude. Thank you to all of our speakers this morning and to all of our co-sponsors. Um, and we will now have a little video <laughs> before you all go. En la esquina estratégica de Sudamérica, bañado por el Mar Pacífico, como puerta de entrada a la Amazonía, está el departamento de Nariño. Frontera de Colombia con Ecuador. Nariño es un territorio colmado de oportunidades para conectar a Colombia y a Sudamérica con el mundo. Nariño es un destino turístico por excelencia, una tierra biodiversa, hogar de especies únicas y humedales de importancia mundial. Cuenta con ríos y lagunas, reservas ecológicas, volcanes y nevados, playas, ballenas y aves de majestuoso colorido. Nariño es la tierra donde se produce hoy por hoy el mejor café especial del mundo. Nariño es manos laboriosas, personas talentosas, deporte y aventura. Nariño es carnaval, donde se mezclan culturas, tradiciones, mitos y leyendas. Nariño es fe, es esperanza, es trabajo, es gente buena. Nariño es territorio de paz. Recorre Nariño, descubre su magia. brings a bit of color to this building. Um, so I feel we, we actually have room for a, a few questions. So um, we've got five minutes. Maria Alejandra, please direct your question to whoever you'd like to answer. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you very much for oh, sorry. Thank you very much for this amazing panel. I, I, I do believe the need that. Uh, well, thank you for your work as well. Thanks. <laughs> the environmental policy needs to talk with the, with the drug policy agenda. Uh, maybe this is a question for Silvia, but for the rest of you as well. And it's the, what do you think about the need of uh, directing, for example, instruments such as the payment for ecosystem services to coca crop farmers uh, or um, yeah, anyone who is cultivating uh, crops for illegal trade? Because I, I do think that that's a, an instrument to help with this uh, transition to legal economies, but also to stop the frontier moving uh, to the forest. I can certainly make a start, but if others also want to, to add, um, certainly. Um, I think it's an interesting um, proposal. Um, and I know there have been very, very initial, exp some experiments also in Colombia with, with payments for ecosystem services in the context of potentially also um, some coca uh, transitions. The only um, ca note of caution I would perhaps introduce here is that, of course, payments for ecosystem services um, benefit those that already are owners of, um, of environmental assets, so to speak. So, um, because the payments have to be directed to um, certain beneficiaries, and often those the beneficiaries that are, that are recognised are those with already with land titles or who already have some kind of um, ownership or management of um, particular environmental goods and services. And so for, for populations that have been displaced, for example, or, or otherwise landless uh, populations, how, to, how the payments for ecosystem services can be structured to benefit those kind of groups is just, is just one concern I have with, with that um, mechanism. But I think it's certainly an interesting incentive and, and reward scheme, and, and to support you know, um, communities that are, are really guardians of uh, of the environment. So, certainly holds promise, but there are also some notes of caution. Um. 
Does anyone else want to say anything? Thanks, Mary. Are there any other questions? Ese también es propaganda de nuestro de, de nuestro país. Nuestro país. El presidente Gustavo Petro ha propuesto un plan para salvar a la Amazonía. Ese plan, según sus palabras, eh, junto con Brasil, oh, together with Brazil, is to. Our president Gustavo Petro has a plan to save the Amazon. He usually says we would pay to them a value, the economic value, every month during the next 20 years. That value would be $600 a month. That would be the price of today. And the president in our government would need funds to be able to do something like that. Practically, uh, It, it's a proposal that doesn't have the figure of prices of paying for services, so that would really leave behind uh, the communities uh, who cultivate coca, no, coca, and it would really be a focus on how do we restore forests regarding the payment for em environmental services to some communities. We have practiced this uh, within the contra contracts where the state doesn't actually give you papers for the land, but it gives you a concession to the family so that they can use that land during a certain amount of time. In the previous government, it was 10 years. They proposed 10 years. The, the families said this doesn't give us enough uh, legal standing, and so they've asked for more years. And so these contracts or these concessions would go to families, and they should be long-term, at least 30 years, so that there's security and stability in those agreements. And finally, we have a great worry with these payments for carbon, because there's certain f si signatures uh, that have happened that aren't really uh, looking at how do we save the Amazon. And some of them have been actions that are really about economic gains and speculation and that don't have to necessarily do with the, fa the, the rights of families that live in these um, areas. In our brother country of Brazil, um, we are, this is a good space for me to say that we are very worried about this. My apologies for my Spanish. Hello. Buenos días a todos y todas. Solamente para reafirmar lo que dice. Reaffirm what Pedro was saying. A country without property owners can't really think about long-term policy. We need that coca cultivators are the owners of their land, not that they loan them the land, because loaned land is not taken care of. When it's your own land, you take care of it, you love it, and you can administrate it. And you can administrate it with love for our children and our grandchildren. Loaned land, we use it, we, we use it and we finish it, and sometimes we give it up to mafias, which can be mining, which can be cattle ranching or drug trafficking, but we need a country of property owners. In the Amazon, there are serious problems with land ownership, and there are serious problems with, in, with, in a st with not having stability, because there are nomad tribes that have not been legally constituted that can take care of protected lands. So we have serious problems where the people see the green of the forest, but they don't see the people who live in those forests. And so we need urgently that there is agreement. The government with, um, gov with agents, with community agents, so that there is a policy really about legal land ownership and that we can have those long-term public policies.
Pedro, do you want to respond? Or, um, no, 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 I think I'm great, good. great. Okay, um, I think that brings us to the end. And um, I just want to encourage you all to be curious, be bold. For many people, the environment is a new thing. It's the defining issue of our time. It can feel really overwhelming, but we have to include it in all of our work. Um, and hopefully in years to come, we will see the change that we're all part of. So thank you so much for attending, and thank you to our co-sponsors and our panel. Um, and our interpreter. And our interpreter. Zara Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.